Well, it is indeed an immense honour to be invited to give this lecture named for uh, the great Ralph Lazara. Uh, Ralph was definitely an icon of our field when I was a junior trainee and I was very fortunate over the years that I got to know him to be able to count him as a friend. And I, I came to know him not just as a luminary scientist, but also as a wonderful person. And it, and it is indeed a humbling honour uh, to be invited to give this uh, lecture. These are my disclosures. And um, I'm going to start with this slide. This slide highlights a number of different studies from recent years, clinical mapping studies, looking at the mechanisms of persistent atrial fibrillation. And we can see from these studies that across, we, across the board, we have the full array of different potential mechanisms. From the 64 basket catheter, 64 electrode basket catheter mapping study of Sanjeev Narayan and stable rotors, to unstable rotors with body surface mapping, unstable rotors and multiple colliding wave fronts of epicardial mapping, the endocardial epicardial dissociation mechanism and longitudinal muscle bundle dissociation described by the group of Maurits Lessi, and the focal driver hypothesis supported by the mapping work of Al Waldo and many other clinical mapping studies to suggest this. And these mechanisms, of course, are not necessarily mutually exclusive, but whichever one of these mechanisms is active, underlying this is the remodeling process. And if we think about the various conditions that associate with atrial fibrillation, whether it be persistent AF itself, conditions of stretch, hypertension, heart failure, advancing age, sleep apnea, more recently recognized obesity and excess alcohol intake, these are the conditions that take a healthy atrium that look like this with the greens and blues at high voltage and turn it into an atrium that looks like this, the so-called remodeled atrium where the reds and yellows of low voltage and the complex signals reflect conduction slowing, voltage redu reduction. And these are the EP markers of what we know underlying is the substrate of fibrosis. In addition to this list, we can now add genetic predisposition. We know that the gene, the single nu nucleotide variant on the 4Q25 gene is the one that is most associated with increased risk of AF and worse AF outcomes. And from this work, which is recently uh, in press from Jeff Wong in our group, we see that that gene is associated with that variant, associates with conduction heterogeneity, with regions of conduction slowing in the posterior left atrium, complex signals, and that this is the mechanism that underlies this impaired single procedure atrial arrhythmia freedom. So this clinical study, this clinical example rather, is a particularly um, illustrative example. This is a patient with persistent atrial fibrillation who after pulmonary vein isolation organized into this regular rhythm, this anterior cir small circuit, you can call that a rotor or a small circuit re-entry in the anterior left atrium. Look at the nature of the signals here, fractionated, low amplitude, long duration, that occur in this region on the voltage map, reds and yellows of very low voltage, the remodeled atrium, the process underlying all of this is, is uh, interstitial fibrosis. We know from the DCAF study, the work of Nasir Marouche on MRI, that the more extensive the fibrosis, as you move from stage one through stage two and three to extensive fibrosis of stage four, that ablation outcomes deteriorate. The more remodeling you have, the worse the outcome. As you can see, the higher the recurrence rate in stage four versus stage one. Well, we do know that persistent atrial fibrillation has more significant remodeling than paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and compared with a control non-AF group. In black bars, the percentage low voltage is greater, conduction uh, uh, time, conduction slowing occurs more markedly, and percent complex electrograms are also greater in persistent compared with paroxysmal AF. What we don't know is to what extent this is driven by the arrhythmia itself 
versus the underlying process, the underlying remodeling process that leads to persistent rather than paroxysmal AF. And importantly, we don't know to what extent this process is reversible. So what evidence is there that we can reverse remodeling with treatment of the arrhythmia? Well, this is an early study from the Bordeaux group in, that shows that in both paroxysmal and chronic atrial fibrillation, very simply, there's significant reduction in atrial dimensions. So reverse structural remodeling, if you will. Thomas Walters in our group more recently demonstrated that with reduction in AF burden with ablation, compared with medical management, here's the burden in the medical management arm, reduced to almost zero following ablation, that there's also recovery of atrial mechanical function. Atrial strain improves, not quite back to control levels, but certainly more marked than the progressive deterioration in the medical treatment arm. And markers of electrical conduction also improve, again, almost back to the control group, and compare that with the medical treatment arm where we see this progressive conduction slowing. So some evidence of reverse remodeling with treatment of the arrhythmia. We also know that sinus node function can recover. In this study from, again, the Bordeaux group, heart rate in increases following successful ablation, corrected sinus node recovery time decreases, and the need for pacing almost eliminated in these patients with prolonged reversion causes. Similarly, our work treating chronic flutter following ablation significant improvements at long-term follow-up in the corrected sinus node recovery time so clear evidence that there is some reverse remodeling the animal studies have not necessarily borne this out this comes again from the group of maritz alessi it's a goat study the goats were subjected to four months of atrial fibrillation and what you see is significant development of myolysis, cell loss, glycogen accumulation, and interstitial fibrosis. But at four months following atrial fibrillation, this is not reversed completely. Myolysis remains, fibrosis remains, and this translates into increased AF duration still present at two and four months compared with baseline. So incomplete reversal after four months of atrial fibrillation. We undertook a study in humans looking at outcomes following um, six months of sinus rhythm after successful ablation. Here's AF pre-ablation compared with control, lower voltages in reds and yellows. But to our surprise, when we followed these patients up after successful ablation, six months later, voltage had continued to decline. Conduction had not significantly improved and the percentage of complex signals on mapping it actually gradually and progressively continued to increase. This was a surprise to us, but I think it really just emphasizes that treatment of the arrhythmia alone may not be enough, that those underlying risk factors that I've been talking about continue to progress the remodeling process. And the more of those risk factors that you have, the less likely we are to see a successful outcome. The more risk factors the greater the remodeling, the less likely <coughs> that success will be maintained in the long term. These are just two scoring systems, the CHAD scoring system, the Apple scoring system, using different risk factors for remodeling, but both showing the same thing, freedom from atrial fibrillation or recurrence rates, freedom lower, recurrence higher, the more of these factors that you have. So what evidence is there then that treating these factors can reverse the remodeling process? And I think I'm gonna start with the work of my colleague, Prash Sanders, whose really seminal work has indicated to us that treating weight and risk factors has significant impact on outcomes. On the left, we see the randomized study published some years ago in atrial fibrillation patients undergoing um, weight loss in a, a dedicated clinic to achieve this, you can see a significant fall in body mass index. And this correlates with very significant reduction in AF burden over a 15 month follow-up period. Similarly, the ARREST AF cohort study, looking at a cohort that underwent aggressive risk factor management. These are obese patients, BMI over 30, 
being treated not just for weight reduction in a dedicated clinic, but also the full array of risk factors, single procedure success rates and multiple procedure success rates significantly better than in the control arm, as you can see here. They took this work a step further in the reverse AF study. This is a five-year follow-up study looking at whether there's a dose response, if you will, between weight loss and outcome. And so in the orange bar here, this is the group who lost more than 10% body weight and maintained this weight loss. And this group had far less progression of their phenotype from paroxysmal through to persistent AF compared with a group here who maintained no significant weight loss over this five year period, indicating perhaps that you can ar arrest or halt the progression of remodeling by intervening and treating risk factors. But more than this, when they looked at those patients who were persistent, obese patients who were persistent, who then lost more than 10% of their body weight, fully 88% of this group reversed from pers persistent back to a paroxysmal phenotype compared with much lower numbers in these intermediate groups, modest weight loss and no uh, significant weight loss over the five year period. And again, this gives us some indication that not only can we arrest the progression, but we may be able to reverse the remodeling and reverse uh, the phenotype from persistent back to paroxysmal. Now, when patients lose weight, a number of risk factors are impacted, which also improve the remodeling process. Sleep apnea gets better, blood pressure improves, glycemic control improves. And with this, there's evidence of structural reverse remodeling. Left atrial volume index decreases in a dose responsive manner, septal dimension decreases in a dose responsive manner. So underpinning the improvement is indeed evidence of reverse structural remodeling. Others have shown the same thing. This is a very nice recent study from the group at the Cleveland Clinic. And they took morbidly obese patients and compared those who underwent bariatric surgery in blue with those who did not in green and also compared them to the non-obese group here in red and showed that the outcomes in those who underwent bariatric surgery were as good as those who were not obese but the morbidly obese patients had really poor outcomes. And if we look at the first column here on the right, uh, on, on the uh, table on the right, first column and compare that to the third column, bariatric surgery versus no bariatric surgery, we can see that there's evidence of fall in systolic blood pressure, reduction in hypertension, improved glycemic control, reduction in LA dimensions, and also reversal from um, persistent back to paroxysmal atrial fibrillation with the bariatric surgery. So evidence that there is some reverse structural remodeling, improvement in risk factors that underpins these improved outcomes. Well, what's the pathology here? What's going on? And these are data that my colleague, Dr. Nalia, will present at this meeting. And what he did in an operating room study was look at the relationship between regional epicardial atrial adipose volume evaluated with CT imaging and the underlying structure of the heart. And what he showed histologically was that there was significant epicardial fat infiltration correlating with this adiposity, that there was regional atrial fibrosis, and that there was connexin 40 lateralization away from the ends of the intercalated disc to the sides here in red, and that these three together caused significant associated mapping of that region, associated conduction slowing, and block, which underpinned the impact of obesity on atrial conduction and the substrate for atrial fibrillation. Does this reverse? Well, to understand this, we need to look at animal studies. And again, unpublished work now from the group of Prash Sanders looking at an obese model uh, in sheep. Sheep overfed become markedly obese and with this develop inflammation. Adipocyte infiltration, as in the human study, increasing fibrosis and reduction in connection. And with 30% weight loss, almost all of this is reversible. Inflammation disappears. There's a reduction in adipocyte infiltration, um, reduction in collagen, as you can see here, and improvement in connection 43 
levels, suggesting at least in this relatively short-term model that much of this is reversible. And together with that, the epicardial mapping demonstrates that the slowed conduction and bunching of isochrones with increased conduction heterogeneity in the obese sheep fully reverses with 30% weight loss back to baseline, conduction returns to normal, and with this, induced AF duration returns to baseline levels. So certainly evidence for reverse remodeling with obesity. Associated with obesity is oftentimes sleep apnea, very strongly now associated with atrial fibrillation. This is an early study that showed in AF patients there was a much higher incidence of moderate in red and severe sleep disordered breathing in green compared with a control population. And numerous other studies have shown similar results. There are multiple potential mechanisms by which sleep apnea leads to atrial fibrillation. We can talk about the underlying progression of substrate, the red line here, due to cardiac remodeling, chronic remodeling, LA dilatation and stretch, LV dilatation and hypertrophy. But the blue bars represent the acute insult each night due to marked intrathoracic pressure change, autonomic nervous system activation, acute atrial stretch, which on any given night might reach the threshold for atrial fibrillation. And there are a number of studies that have shown the relationship between sleep disordered breathing and atrial remodeling, progressive atrial remodeling. And in this particular study presented at Heart Rhythm 2020, we showed a relationship, a continuous relationship, that is the, the more severe the sleep disordered breathing, the more advanced the remodeling. Bipolar voltage falls, conduction is impaired, complex signals increase, and this is more marked in persistent than paroxysmal AF, and notably persistent AF patients have more severe sleep disordered breathing. Well, at the same meeting and awarded the Eric Pristowski Award, at this meeting, Heart Rhythm 2020, Dr. Nalia undertook a small randomized study of AF patients undergoing randomization to either CPAP or no CPAP in the six month lead up prior to ablation and showed that there is indeed evidence of reverse remodeling if you treat these patients. CPAP Im improvements in conduction, improvements in bipolar voltage, reduction in complex electrograms, all significant when compared with the untreated group. So evidence that you can reverse remodeling, but in order to do this, you have to have excellent CPAP compliance. In the graph, this is the line here that marks four hours CPAP a night, this particular patient, you can see excellent compliance. With this compliance, you have dramatic reduction in the overall apnea hypopnea index from over 40 down to under 10. And what you're really looking for here is average usage of more than four hours per night in order to achieve this. Now, this was achievable in a small study with intense follow-up. Whether this is achievable in large populations becomes less clear because CPAP compliance is something that is very challenging. We do see from small, non-randomized, largely observational studies that if you treat patients, they do have better outcomes. So patients with sleep apnea and atrial arrhythmias do better with uh, treatment, CPAP treatment, post-cardioversion, post-pulmonary vein isolation. And it's these small studies that led the consensus group to recommend a 2A classification for treatment of sleep apnea can be useful is the verbiage for patients with AF, including those uh, undergoing AF ablation. These are small studies, and I think whether or not these encouraging results can be translated into large populations remains to be seen in bigger randomized studies. Well, hypertension, another critic condition critically associated with atrial fibrillation. If we look at a, a sample of uh, basic studies looking at the impact of hypertension on the atrium, we consistently see the development of atrial fibrosis seen in this middle study and the progressive development of atrial fibrillation, the hallmark underlying um, the association between hypertension and atrial fibrillation. So is any of that reversible? Well, my colleague, Dr. McClellan, undertook this small study in patients with refractory hypertension treated with renal denervation. And with this treatment, there were improvements in 
mean systolic and diastolic blood pressure and also in maximum systolic blood pressure. And that improvement in blood pressure translated at mapping to improvements in atrial conduction. And there was a clear correlation between the improvement in blood pressure and the improvement in conduction. Well, just very recently, in the last months, John Steinberg and colleagues published this randomized clinical trial, the Eradicate AF trial, also looking at patients with refractory hypertension and atrial fibrillation and randomized to either just ablation or ablation plus renal denervation, showing significantly better outcomes in those patients who received renal denervation compared with the increased recurrence rates in those having pulmonary vein isolation alone. And if we look at other markers, secondary markers of that study, you can see that this was associated with significant improvements in blood pressure, 10 millimeter and 20 millimeter reduction greater in the renal denervation group. And this translated into reverse structural remodeling, left atrial dimension reduced by more than two millimeters in the renal denervation group and interventricular septal thickness reduced. So that the improved clinical outcome may have been due to this reverse structural remodeling. But I'd like to move on to alcohol, a topical area, particularly during lockdown. And this study that looked at the impact of mild and moderate drinking, just seven drinks per week on atrial remodeling, and found that even that number of drinks per week over the long term can have some impact on atrial remodeling. Conduction velocity slows, voltage falls, and in this observational study from a Chinese group, moderate and heavy drinking translated into worse outcomes following AF ablation. Now these data led my colleagues, uh, Dr. Voska Boynik and Kissler to perform this randomized study looking at the impact of alcohol abstinence on AF outcomes in people drinking more than 10 standard drinks a week. And you'll see that the challenge to this study is the vast majority of people screened were simply not prepared to abstain. They wanted to keep drinking. But we did wind up with 140 patients randomized to abstinence or control, and the 17 drinks a week was the main median. And in the abstinence group, there was a significant reduction. They did comply very well compared with the control group who continued to drink at about the same level, minor reduction only. And the impact of this abstinence was a significant improvement, significant uh, delay in time to AF recurrence, increased AF free survival by 37% present in both the paroxysmal and the persistent AF groups. And particularly, let's look at the AF burden and those patients who in follow-up had zero AF burden approaching 50% in the abstinence group, just half of that in the control group. And with this improved quality of life, those with no or mild symptoms improved dramatically in the abstinence group, whereas those with moderate or severe in green and purple in the control group increased in terms of symptom severity. And there was evidence of reverse structural remodeling. Left atrial area and volume index decreased in the abstinence but not the control group. Emptying fraction improved only in the abstinence group. So again, structural reverse remodeling underlying improved clinical outcomes. Well, if you're starting to feel a little depressed that you have to give up alcohol, I do have some encouraging news. Our colleagues like to frequently like to tell our arrhythmia patients that they have to give up caffeine. So we looked at this systematically. This is work from my colleague, Dr. Voska Boynik. And in a very large systematic review, this is just a small number of the studies, we found either no correlation or association between caffeine and AF, or indeed perhaps in a small number of studies that this was protective. So at the very least, you can continue to drink the coffee. Well, the relationship between heart failure and AF is very well established. And the question of whether or not remodeling reverses is less clear. These are data from the camera MRI study, a study undertaken by Dr. Prabhu and Dr. Kissler, that showed that if you successfully treat persistent AF, ejection fraction can improve dramatically. 
and that this improves most in those that have no scar, LG negative, but also in those who do have some scar, the LG positive group. The question is, what happens to the atrial remodeling? And the same authors looked at this late, at two years of follow-up, and the results are a little disappointing. Remember, this is a group that have now been treated successfully for persistent AF and for heart failure. They're in sinus rhythm with resumption of normal ejection fraction, and yet bipolar voltage, patchy increases in only some areas, conduction across the board didn't really improve significantly, some reduction in fractionated electrograms, but segmental only. So that this doesn't seem to be really fully reversible. And if we look to the animal studies, maybe this result is not surprising. This is early work from Stan Mattel's group, the tacky pacing heart failure model in dogs that showed that with pacing, dogs develop significant fibrosis with this increasing AF duration compared with control. But at five weeks of recovery, fibrosis persists, AF duration and inducibility persists. No recovery in a heart failure model. Elsewhere, stretch uh, mediated mechanisms for atrial remodeling, the data are also mixed. This is a study looking at the impact of balloon valvuloplasty in severe mitral stenosis. And following valvuloplasty, as expected, mitral valve area improves. LA size decreases quite dramatically and atrial pressures decrease. And with this, both acutely in the light blue bars and chronically in the darker blue bars, conduction improves and regional bipolar voltage improves, as can be seen in these examples. The areas of purple and blue increase over time. So that this model of atrial stretch does seem to show some reverse remodeling. But in other studies, this hasn't been borne out. This is a study we undertook some years ago, looking at reverse remodeling following ASD closure. And although atrial volumes significantly decrease in both right and left atrium, Conduction delay persists at late follow-up. And regional conduction delay, these are extensive double potentials at the Christa terminalis, does not improve. So patchy results for reverse remodeling in different studies. If we ask the question, can cardiac fibrosis go away? We need look no further than this very nice review from Stan Mattel, who described the different types of fibrosis. And that reactive or interstitial fibrosis may under certain circumstances decrease. Whereas replacement fibrosis, where there's cell death and the fibrosis is part of the reparative process, this is not something of course that we can reverse. And if we look to earlier pathology studies, comparing the nature of remodeling in atrial fibrillation versus sinus rhythm patients, we indeed do see that there's cell loss, myolysis, programmed cell death with glycogen accumulation, loss of myofibrils, but there's also interstitial fibrosis. And it may be that it's a question of the relative contribution of interstitial fibrosis versus um, fibrosis that is indeed replacement that will determine whether or not some reversibility can occur. But I'd like to finish up with this clinical example. This is a patient who underwent AF ablation in our department back in 2005. You can see from the implanted device that the patient was having virtually 24 hours a day of atrial fibrillation, persistent AF. Here's where ablation was performed and AF melts away. This is 2005, here it is 2010 and 2016. But then 13 years later, inexplicably perhaps, the patient starts to have high burden paroxysmal atrial fibrillation again. Now over that 13 year period, the patient had gained 12 kilos, had developed hypertension, significant sleep apnea. And one can hypothesize that this is what drove remodeling to develop a new trigger in the posterior left atrium. Posterior left atrial isolation targeting this region of trigger again has rendered over the subsequent year or two, has rendered this patient arrhythmia free. But it's interesting to speculate that if we had prevented or treated these risk factors, that we might have prevented the progressive remodeling which led 
to further atrial fibrillation. So I'd like to just end with this slide, looking at a particular phenotype of atrial fibrillation, that is progression from sinus rhythm through paroxysmal and persistent to permanent AF. And underlying that are the risk factors that drive progressive remodeling. When we get to advanced remodeling, it may be impossible to think that significant reversal is possible. But here in the middle, not only can we arrest remodeling, but we might be able to some extent to reverse the remodeling if, not only, if we not only treat the arrhythmia itself, but we also treat the associated risk factors. And I think that there is emerging evidence that suggests that this is indeed important. And with that, I'd like to again thank you for this immense honour and stop there. Um, I, I would like to simply mention all of the people who've come through my lab over many years, the people who've done this work, uh, wonderful people, friends and colleagues, and perhaps sing, single out two of them, uh, that is my good friends and colleagues, Prash Sanders and Pete Kistler, whom it has been a great pleasure to be working with over this time. I would also like to uh, say that um, if you like to post any questions uh, regarding this talk, I would be only too happy uh, to answer them. So thank you very much.